welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to be talking about the element indium. Here I have a small sample of it in a glass vial. Hope you can see that. Let's get back to our presentation. Here you see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. Incidentally, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which you can pick up from the online Exploratorium store if you want your own copy. Check out his fantastic website, PeriodicTable.com. Indium is the 49th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 49 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as this unique element. Indium is a silvery gray metal that resembles tin in appearance. It was discovered in 1863 by Ferdinand Reich and Hieronymus Theodor Richter, not the earthquake scale guy. They discovered indium by spectroscopic, not chemical methods. The metal indium was isolated in the next year, 1864. You might think that indium was named after the subcontinent of India, but that was not the case. Reich and Richter named the element for the brilliant blue-violet line in its spectrum. That color is, of course, indigo, hence indium. An interesting side note, Reich, who was colorblind, employed Richter as an assistant for detecting the colored spectral lines. The universe produces most of its indium in merging neutron stars, a pretty exotic factory. Smaller amounts are produced in dying low-mass stars. Here on Earth, the main suppliers of indium are, not surprisingly, also the main suppliers of zinc, since it's produced as a byproduct of zinc refinement. China is the leading producer of indium, producing almost 40% of the indium in the world followed by South Korea with 31%, then Japan and Canada and others. Production of indium has grown rapidly since the mid-80s to about 760 tons per year currently. Indium is a minor component in zinc sulfide ores like this beautiful specimen of sphalerite, which is a very common ore mined specifically for its zinc content. The sample you see here is an unusual, very pure specimen of gem quality. Indium occurs in less than 10 minerals, like the dark inclusions in this polished slab of rochasite. Rochasite is copper indium sulfide. The American Chemical Society's endangered element list places indium as, quote, serious threat in the next 100 years. So, we need to keep our eye on this and be sure to recycle our indium. How common is indium? Not very. Let's see. It's the 78th most common element in the universe way down there. It's the 46th most common element in the sun. The 71st most common element in meteorites. In the Earth's crust, it's the 65th most common element taking up about uh, 50 parts per billion of the Earth's crust. In the oceans, very rare. The 76th most common element in the oceans. As a matter of fact, it has the lowest abundance of any non-radioactive element. And in us, it doesn't exist. 0% in humans. If we compare the size of the indium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The indium atom is about three times the size of hydrogen. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Indium is a mid-sized atom. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. 49 protons for indium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms, called isotopes, are chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 39 isotopes of indium, and of these, there is only one 
stable, non-radioactive isotope, indium-113. Indium is therefore a monoisotopic element. There are 23 of those. You'd think that this stable isotope would make up all the indium in the universe, but it only makes up a mere 4.29% of the indium in existence. What's going on here? To find the missing indium, you have to take a look at one of its radioactive isotopes, indium-115. It accounts for the rest, 95.71% of known indium. We'll see why in the next slide. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos meaning same or equal, and topos meaning place, since all these various forms of indium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of indium, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. What's a half-life? Well, if you have a certain amount of one of these isotopes and you wait one half-life, half of it will decay. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter, and so on. As you can see, the longest half-life here is for that isotope making up over 95% of existing indium. Indium-115 has a half-life of 4.1 times 10 to the 14th years, that's 410 trillion years, or almost 30,000 times the age of the universe. So you see that extremely little of this isotope has had enough time to decay significantly. Indium is one of three known elements, the others being tellurium and rhenium, where the stable isotope is less abundant in nature than the long-lived radioactive isotope. Indium is moderately dense at 7.31 grams per cubic centimeter. Remember that water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put a couple more densities up here for comparison. Iron is slightly denser than indium. Iron's density is uh, 7.89 grams per cubic centimeter. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When we do this talk at the Exploratorium, we have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself. But we'll have to wait to do this until we're back at the museum. Our set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and magnesium. We also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, indium's density is 7.31 grams per cubic centimeter, about the same as tin. Indium is the 45th densest element. Indium has the 81st highest melting point. Maybe a better way of saying that is that there are only 11 non-gaseous elements that melt at lower temperatures. Indium melts at a fairly low 156.6 degrees Celsius, or 314 degrees Fahrenheit, only 56 degrees C above boiling water. You couldn't melt it in a boiling pot of water, but live steam would do the trick. Indium has the 53rd highest boiling point, at 2,072 degrees Celsius. That's 1,915 degrees Celsius above its melting point of 156.6 degrees C. A pretty big difference between melting and boiling. Indium has the same distinction as our previous element, cadmium, a fairly high thermal expansion rate. Indium has the sixth highest thermal expansion rate. It expands one part per 31,000 per degree Celsius in temperature rise. That means that if you had, say, a one meter bar of indium, it would get longer by about three one hundred thousandths of a meter, or three one hundredths of a millimeter, when you raised its temperature by one degree Celsius. That doesn't seem like much, but it does add up when you change the temperature significantly, or have a long bar of indium. 
Indium is very soft. With a hardness of only 1.5 on Mohs scale of hardness, it's the softest metal that is not an alkali metal. Remember that alkali metals are in the column at the far left of the periodic table. Those all react violently in water, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on. In this chart of hardness, sorted from hardest, boron, on the left, to softest, cesium, on the right, indium is the 60th hardest, or rather the 7th softest, element. It's so soft that you can easily cut through a rather thick piece with a common knife. Indium is the 20th best conductor of electricity. Not bad, but not good enough to use it for this quality. Indium is the 24th best conductor of heat. Again, not bad, but not excellent either. From our periodic table of the spectra, we see that indium displays a variety of emission lines across the spectrum. Remember, indium was discovered from this spectrum, from that bright indigo line, before anyone actually held a piece of the element in their hand. At room temperature, indium is a solid. Inside this lamp, it's vaporized by a glowing gas, probably argon, and then stimulated to glow by the flowing of electricity, giving off a beautiful indigo glow. Because of its rarity, Indium is moderately expensive, currently about $275 per kilogram. Not too expensive to have industrial uses, but more expensive than many other elements. Over the years, the price of indium has varied wildly, from a low price of around $100 per kilogram in the early 2000s, that's after the USSR and China opened their resources, to a monumental growth in the mid-2000s when it started to be used for the manufacture of LCD panels, bumping the price to over $1,000 per kilogram. And then other ups and downs because of market and governmental manipulations. Again, the price nowadays is in the neighborhood of $275 per kilogram. Let's take a look at some of the major uses for indium. Indium tin oxide is a clear conductor of electricity. Let me say that again. It's a conductor of electricity that you can see through. It's used in applications such as liquid crystal panels. You'll find those in your phones, computer screens, and televisions, to mention a few. You'll see, you see an extreme close-up of an LCD panel on the right, with live video on the top. Let's look at a cross-section. Electrical current must flow between the two turquoise electrodes on the back and front of the panel. That's what switches the liquid crystals on and off, becoming either opaque or transparent. Light must somehow get to us from the light source on the back side of the panel. Normal conductors like copper and aluminum are opaque and would block the light. Indium tin oxide, or ITO as it's referred to in the industry, is both conductive and transparent, so it's a natural for this application, letting through the light allowed past the liquid crystals, and then through the colored filter in front, and finally getting to us. This is the major use for indium. LCD panels are carefully recycled to recover scrap indium. There are other uses of this interesting clear conductor that includes anti-static coatings, electromagnetic shielding, solar cells, aircraft windshields, and freezer glass for demisting. Another application for LCDs is privacy glass that can be switched from opaque to transparent. This example in the bathroom is from intelligent glass. You can't do this without the transparent electrodes made from indium tin oxide within the panels. By the way, this isn't cheap, around $50 per square foot, so this example would cost you about $8,000. A copper, indium, gallium, selenide solar cell, or SIGS cell, is a thin film solar cell used to convert sunlight into electric power. 
It's manufactured by depositing a thin layer of copper, indium, gallium, and selenium on glass or plastic backing, along with electrodes on the front and back to collect current. Because the material strongly absorbs sunlight, a much thinner film is required than other semiconductor materials. SIGS is one of three mainstream photovoltaic technologies, the other two being cadmium telluride, which we covered in the previous Everything Matters, and amorphous silicon. SIGS layers are thin enough to be flexible, allowing them to be deposited on flexible substrates, like you see here. Being a low melting temperature element, indium has found some use in soldering, or joining pieces in the electronics industry. This is only used where absolutely necessary, since indium is more expensive than many other solders. Fields metal, named after its inventor Simon Quellen Field, is a eutectic alloy. The word eutectic comes from the Greek eu, meaning well, and texas, not the state, meaning melting. Well, maybe not a bad description of the state after all, but I digress. A eutectic alloy melts at a temperature that's lower than the melting point of any of its ingredients. Note that all the ingredients of Fields metal melt above 156 degrees Celsius. Fields metal is a solid at room temperature, but becomes a liquid at the low temperature of approximately 62 degrees Celsius, or 144 degrees Fahrenheit, less than half the lowest melting temperature of any of its ingredients. It's an alloy of indium, bismuth, and tin in the percentages you see here. An even more impressive example of a low-melting eutectic alloy is galenstan, which gets its name from its ingredients, gallium, indium, and tin. The old name for tin was the Latin stanum, the stan in galenstan, and the chemical symbol for tin, SN. Galenstan is an alloy of 68.5% gallium, 21.5% indium, and 10% tin. It remains a liquid below the freezing point of water. Its melting point is minus 19 degrees Celsius, or minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Gallenstan can be substituted for mercury in thermometers, since it's now illegal to use toxic mercury in medical thermometers. Metallic parts can be electroplated with indium and then bonded together simply by pressing the indium-plated surfaces together. This process is called cold welding. Just press the two indium-plated surfaces together and they're welded. No heat necessary. Indium can be used for low-temperature cryogenic vacuum sealing. It does a better job than rubber or silicone O-rings, especially at low temperatures and with small molecule gases like hydrogen and helium. Part of this capability comes from the fact that soft indium cold welds to the gasket flanges, even if both sides are different materials. Here, you see Casey Evans of Washington State University installing a cryogenic indium wire seal. Even though indium is not as thermally conductive as, say, copper or silver, it does have one advantage. Because of its softness, if you squeeze a thin layer of indium between a hot object and a heat sink, it compresses and spreads to make very good thermal contact between the two, allowing the heat to be drawn away a bit more efficiently. Here we see thin indium sheets designed for this purpose. Another space-filling application of indium, invented in 1962, is its use in dental amalgam, or the filling that replaces the cavity in a tooth. Usually a mixture of mercury and silver, and maybe a couple other elements, the addition of up to 10% indium reduced the creep of the filling, increased its strength, and significantly reduced the mercury vapor emitted from the restoration, making it safer. Indium is used in a variety of LEDs, or light-emitting diodes. These light-emitting diodes uh, emit light across the visible spectrum from red 
to ultraviolet. Let me show you some of these LEDs. Here, I've built a little board with a bunch of LEDs on it. Unfortunately, the LEDs are so bright, they kind of wipe out the camera here. So let me put a neutral density filter so you can see the colors a little bit better. Here you can see that it's emitting colors from red all the way across the spectrum to green, to cyan, to blue, even white up in the corner there. It's pretty cool. Let's get back to the presentation. Without indium, we wouldn't have the all-important blue LED. The typical blue LED is made from indium gallium nitride. This LED was such a breakthrough in the early 90s that its inventors, Hiroshi Amano, Isamu Akasaki, and Shuji Nakamura, received the 2004 Nobel Prize for it. Without the blue LED, we wouldn't have the white LED. Here's why. The blue LED powers all modern white LED lamps that we have in our homes. White LED lamps use only one-fifth the electricity that incandescent lamps of equivalent brightness, saving energy and hence putting far less CO2 into the environment. Here's how that works. An electrical contact, typically shaped like a reflective cup, has a blue emitting indium gallium nitride LED soldered to it. I'm not showing the top connecting wire. When powered, this LED produces a bright blue light. On top of the blue LED is placed a blob of encapsulated phosphor that fluoresces and emits yellow light when excited by the blue output of the LED. Now we have both blue and yellow light coming from our device. Blue and yellow light are complementary colors that, when combined, create what we perceive as white light. Solid-state lasers, basically specialized LEDs, have virtually taken over from their older-style gas laser cousins. Solid-state lasers are far more efficient, far cheaper to mass-produce, and last longer with less fuss. They also don't require the dangerous high-voltage power supplies of older gas lasers. Virtually all solid-state lasers in the visible range, including all those battery-powered laser pointers you use to entertain your cat, have laser diodes that contain indium. Yinmin Blue, also known as Oregon Blue, is an inorganic blue pigment that was accidentally discovered by Professor Mas Subramanian and his then graduate student Andrew Smith at Oregon State University in 2009. It's the first inorganic blue pigment discovered in over 200 years. The last one was cobalt blue, identified in 1802. The Yinmin name comes from its ingredients the rare earth yttrium, indium, and manganese. It's a beautiful blue pigment. Dr. Subramanian was nice enough to send me a sample. Uh, let me show it to you. Here we go. Here is a sample of blue, just gorgeous blue, yinmin pigment that Dr. Subramanian sent me. Indium plays no natural biological role, and it's not normally found in the human body. However, indium tin oxide used in those LCD panels can harm the pulmonary and immune systems, so exposure in LCD manufacturing must be monitored. We'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about indium's creation in the universe. Cadmium's daughter by way of neutron capture, adrift in stardust. Thank you for watching Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. The next program in this series will examine another interesting and perhaps more common element, tin. We hope you'll join us. This program, like all Exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. We know that this time is challenging, but if you can, 
Help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www.exploratorium.edu connect. Thank you.